All right, I'd like to call our meeting to order. Welcome everyone to uh, our council meeting this evening. A roll call. Um, Councillor um, Alicia Higgison is on personal leave and all others are present. First, before I move on, I'd like to report that uh, we had a closed meeting. Um, a, a count, uh, that's a meeting that council uh, was just held in accordance with and as permitted uh, with section 239.2 CH of the Municipal Act 2001, which states a meeting or part of a meeting may be closed to the public in the subject matter being considered is C, a proposed or pending acquisition or disposition of land by the municipality or local board or H, an information explicitly supplied in confidence to the municipality or local board by Canada, province or territory or crown agency of any of them. During this uh, meeting, uh, we received information on two matters of which uh, such information was explicitly supplied in confidence and council provided direction to administration on a potential land acquisition matter. So we'll take a moment uh, uh, of reflection and then we'll uh, ask uh, the audience to please stand for our national anthem. like to do our land acknowledgement uh, that we are in the land that's surrounded by water originally inhabited by our, our indigenous people who have traveled this area since time immemorial. This territory is within the lands honored by the Wampum Treaties, agreements between the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, the Lenni and Lenape, allied nations to peacefully share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. Specifically, we would like to acknowledge the presence of the Three Fires Confederacy, the Ojibwe, Ottawa, and Potawatomi, Yuran Wandat peoples and the Caldwell First Nation. We are dedicated to honoring Indigenous history and culture while remaining committed to moving forward respectfully with all First Nations, Inuit and Métis. To the members, uh, any disclosure of pecuniary interest on the agenda as presented to you this evening? None. Move on to the minutes. We have the minutes of the regular council meeting of July 25th, 2023. Uh, and those minutes, uh, we are looking to have them duplicated and delivered to the members and to be adopted. Councillor Tonio moves. Councillor uh, Houston, support. On those minutes, any errors or omissions? Hearing none, all in favor? Opposed? That is carried. We do have a supplementary item uh, that's been added to the regular uh, agenda regarding the report PWES 2023-58 and bylaw 2023-87 be approved. Council Houston, Council Dorner, all in favor? Always if any, that is carried. And now we'd like to move uh, to our delegations. And first and foremost, want to welcome everyone uh, this evening to our public uh, meeting. And I believe Mr. Leo DeMars, the BIA Board of uh, Management, and uh, uh, also the chair, 
will come forward uh, with uh, Lauren Carcelin, the Director and Head of Marketing and Beautification Committee. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. No, I will. I'm going to just say a few words first. Sure. Yeah. Well, thank you, Your Worship, and thank you, uh, Council Members. We are uh, here to respectfully um, submit for our budget for 2023 and, and onward. I know that uh, we are, um, we're looking for, you know, we the BIA has always carried out a, its mission in, in uh, a very good manner and, and uh, with, with integrity and, and uh, what we're looking though is to take that vision and expand it and kind of follow in the footsteps of our town and, and looking at all of the things that are going on. We've got a battery plant coming. We've got a hotel coming. We've got expansion going all across the town. Uh, what we're looking at is, is the opportunity to really take our members' uh, hard-earned dollars and add some synergy to that and give them some return on investment that they couldn't do on their own. And so um, I'm gonna pass that over to Laura to add some uh, details to that. Thank you. Um, so it's my pleasure to be here today to talk to you a little bit about the two committees um, that I'm involved with. So one is the marketing committee. So just on the previous slide there, if we can go back. Yep, so just the one before that, sorry. Yes, okay, great. This is one of the drafts of what we envision to be uh, the Tecumseh BIA's new logo. So I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with um, the logo that we previously had. Uh, this is part of our marketing plans. Um, as you can see here, we're looking for vibrancy. We're looking for um, something that encompasses the community and we really want to launch the BIA and market it in a way that it hasn't been marketed before. So we can go to the next slide. So our marketing strategy overview is of course a new logo. We want to update our website. We're looking to grow BIA awareness through social media platforms like Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube in order to drive traffic to the businesses in our community and our area. Um, we want to provide helpful resources to current business owners and potential investors. We'd like to create a visually appe appealing content for businesses in the area, maybe host business spotlights and visibility, therefore adding value to our BIA membership. We're looking to collaborate with influencers and bloggers to amplify the BIA community and reach a larger audience. And our marketing company is also going to assist us with some market research and help us discover who our target audience is. And we'd like to include some media, video, and photography. Thank you. Next slide. All right, so um, looking at one of our biggest highlights is going to be our new and improved website. So currently, as it stands right now, our website is not mobile friendly. So we definitely want our new website to be able to show up on your phones just the very much same way that it would on your personal computer. Um, it, we would like it to include a business directory by category with links to different businesses, including an interactive map. We want an exclusive page specifically for the Tecumseh Dollars program with a possible online purchase option now that we are going towards a paperless program for that. We're going to ensure that the website has up-to-date business information, traffic information, town projects, and anything that the town would like to share with us that we can promote on our page as well. And we're also going to include an information page for prospective businesses and investors you know, why come to Tecumseh? And that's what this page is going to speak to. We're going to include an events page, calendar with events. We're going to track engagement through Google Analytics, and we're going to have search engine optimization. And those are just a few things that the marketing company that we have hired is going to help us with. So when we were doing our discovery meeting uh, with our marketing company, we were looking at a few other BIA websites for comparison, and I've highlighted three here for you. 
I don't know whether or not you want to link to these pages, but it'll give you an idea of more or less what we're looking for. So definitely a more interactive web page that includes a lot more media, visuals, easy to access links, uh, not too much information, but a lot more, again, media. And, you know, just, just to really catch the eye and be more attractive to the audience. And I believe that's it for the marketing committee. Does anybody have any questions before I speak to beautification? Any questions at this stage, members of council? Okay. No, carry on. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about what we're doing with the beautification committee and go to the next slide, please. So this is currently what our Tecumseh Main Street looks like now. And next slide. This is what we would like it to look like. And I'm sure some of you can recognize old Walkerville. Um, you know, what you're looking at here is florals, landscaping, um, you know, charming light posts, walkable areas. Um, and I think this really goes in line with where the town of Tecumseh wants to be headed um, with some of the projects that you're working on. Uh, what you see in the left photo here is Niagara on the Lake and RBIA feels that, you know, this is achievable. This is something that we can do. And, and if we do this, we will attract more people to come out to the area and to support the local businesses in this area. Next slide, please. So we do have some short-term BIA goals. Uh, we want to include benches, garbage receptacles, bike racks, similar to the ones that you have here in your new area. Uh, definitely want to include more planters, greenery, um, some themed banners for our light posts to showcase our new logo. And you'll see here, um, we did sort of narrow down the look of what we're going for. We see um, this community is, you know, charming. We wanted to do something that was a little bit different. Um, so these are the look of the benches that we have chosen. Uh, and we do understand that we're going to have to work with the town on this for installation purposes and everything else. So certainly we're not going to proceed with anything without talking to anybody first. Um, but just a visual for you to see the direction that we're looking to go in. The next slide. So we wanted to come up with some short-term goals uh, that we can do at least now uh, to bring something to the community. So we decided that we were gonna include a small holiday lights display in the BIA Parkette area. So if you can move to the next slide, please. So we're looking at things similar to what Windsor Lights has right now downtown. Obviously it's gonna be on a very much smaller scale, um, but, photo opportunities where people can go and take pictures and hopefully hashtag to come see to come see BIA and sort of bring people out to take photos and to be involved in the community. So these next few slides are just a few samples of uh, what we're looking at to do in that area. So you can proceed to the next slide here. And I think perhaps there's one more. Okay. So our long-term beautification goals, I believe goes in line with uh, where the town is also looking to be headed. Uh, we wanna see additional landscaping, large flower pots, trees is a big one. And I know it's a big one for the town as well. Um, we'd like to see new light posts with electrical outlets so that we can um, use them for possible Christmas lights to hang on the actual light posts. I don't know that we have, it's my understanding we have some, I don't know where they are yet. So that's something that we're working on. Um, so again, that's pretty much it for beautification right now. Thank you. So when, when we're looking at the budget, I mean, the biggest part of this is that you can have all the, the great thoughts and, and dreams, but you need two things. One, you need the money. And two, you need the people. You need to be able to implement ideas. You can't just uh, ask four or five volunteers to try to implement these kind of ambitions. So we're, we, we have one uh, employee on, on staff right now. We're looking at uh, bringing on another to assist that person so that person can be released on the community instead of having to stay in and doing taking care of administrative uh, task. We want that person to be our backbone 
to uh, be able to implement these ambitious goals. Um, we're, we're also not looking at a large amount of money here. We're talking about the, the Come CBIA currently as it stands is very small compared to most BIAs our size. Um, I've spoken, I, went, I spent four days at the conference in London uh, a few months ago, um, spoke with many of my peers and, and uh, uh, most of them are, their budgets are five, six times ours. Um, even, you know, as close as uh, Windsor has budgets that are five, six times our size. So we're not looking at uh, trying to go too large too fast, but what we're looking at is we can't, we can't do anything meaningful with what we're doing now. And so we need to be able to uh, develop a vision that we've done and then to implement it. And we put, a, we put together a very thoughtful and uh, well-considered budget to help bring us into the, the next few years. We want to, like I say, create a strategy with the town to, to you know, piggyback with the CIP, to look at, you know, the development of uh, the marketing strategies for the four regions of Tecumseh that the, the town is already spearheading. We want to um, embrace all of that. And, but in order to do that outreach with our, with our members and to provide them with great service, we need to be able to, you know, increase our ability to provide uh, the information, the website, the marketing, the, the uh, we, we need analytics. Um, there's a lot, a lot more things that we are ambitiously looking to do in the future, but right now uh, we think we've got a pretty well-grounded um, look towards uh, getting through 2023 and looking forward to 2024 and beyond. We, you know, we've got mostly a new group of members in the BIA um, and the energy that they're bringing and the, 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 uh, the passion that they're bringing um, is going to be pretty hard to hold back once we really start uh, getting, getting moving. And so we've, we've just started hitting the ground and we're really looking forward to going on from there. So any other questions at this point? Questions or? Yep, go ahead. Uh, th thank you, Worship. And, um, you know, uh, thank you and welcome to all of our, you know, BIA members. Um, you know, we've got Eddie and Sandra uh, Josh and and Jules there in the back, and I know I've been you know quite involved with this group as as has James. So um, you know I uh, I've kind of lived and been through the budget um, almost as much as our our team members here, uh, but we couldn't come to the or you couldn't get to the point that we are today without the the effort and the um, the time that yeah, each and every one of you has has spent on the budget. So. You know, thank you for coming. Thank you for being here. Uh, I I do think it. it you know, and, and as um, Leo has mentioned, there's uh, it is an increase, but I do realize sitting through and when you start talking about beautification and uh, talking about a lot of these numbers, it does add up very quickly. Um, and I'm I'm proud of the work that you've done, and and it's the it's business owners, right? And it's the ones who are paying the levy, the ones that are uh, seeing the results of the levy have that have really put this together. Um, and I think there's um, there, there's some ambitious goals, but I think the plans are on point and you're coming now with, um, you know, meat, you're, you're meat on the bone, right? You, you've got skin in the game um, and especially with the beautification, with the uh, you know, the, the, the benches, um, you know, the, the tangible things that, you know, business owners will see. I think the BIA here is really stepping up and, you know, putting, um, you know, putting some commitment behind it. Um, I, I do think, and I know I've, I've spoken to Brian and I've spoken to, to Phil, we've got to get, uh, a, you know, a meeting set up and definitely involve parks um, to, you know, sit down and kind of coordinate uh, the, the support that you're now bringing 
for the beautification budget. And, um, you know, I can only see, uh, you know, things growing and, uh, you know, those tangible assets being there in the ground. So I really don't have any questions because I know I've been part of it, but I'll leave it up to my members of council. Before I give it to the deputy mayor, just with the point that you made in terms of uh, obviously the levies is the business owners that are actually uh, asked to contribute in that. And uh, in, in your meetings or deliberations and so forth, uh, have you gone out to talk to some of the business people in terms of the increase? And, and uh, uh, to me, that would be my question in terms of uh, is obviously at the end of the day, um, it, it's their dollars and, and uh, that you'll be uh, bringing forward. And, and I, I agree in terms of the comments that the uh, councillor uh, Houston just brought up in terms of, um, you know, the, I, I, I can see the enthusiasm, you know, in, in the new board and, and what they want to bring uh, certainly to the table and that, but um, just a conversation with, uh, with um, you know, the ones who are going to be paying the bill, so to speak. What do they feel? That's my number one question. And uh, I'll let you answer on that one. And then I'll, I'll give you my second. Okay. So what you're asking is for us to be able to have the ability to have that kind of outreach, the ability to um, interface with our membership. And that's why we need this budget. We don't have that ability. I do. I can say when I went to that uh, OBIA um conference i talked to a lot of other people who are in similar situations um i asked them what it was like to have uh you know a, a levy that was larger um and and basically what they all told me was that membership craved information analytics they wanted to know why people were shopping there they wanted to know um uh, what their money, what their dollars were used for, but the fact that they're, they, they can't do as an individual business what the BIA can do for them. And what I recognized was that we were unable to deliver in that regard because we didn't have the, the uh, infrastructure to do so. And this is the starting ground of that, because we need to be able to do that outreach. We don't have the personnel in place to do so. You're asking me, did, did I go around calling people? Or, you know, if I send out an email to our membership, the, the response on that is usually, you know, if we send out two, 300 emails, we might get one back. So, so it's not the outreach we're doing right now is ineffective. And so um, that's, that's the answer I have is, is we couldn't with the way we are now. We need to redraw it and we need to restructure it so that we can um, start providing better uh, services to our members. And that required us to go, to go from uh, a glorified Tecumseh Dollars program to an actual uh, machine that can deliver um, and implement. Okay, Deputy Mayor, thank you. Yeah. Through you, your mayor. Thank you. Just to go in back, I want to also thank uh, Leo and Laura for presenting this evening. As you see the budget uh, and, and also the, the support that you have from your board of directors, I want to thank our Councillor Liaison, uh, Councillor Dorner, Councillor Houston, who sit on the board as well. Ten years ago when I sat on or other members sat on, the, the, the vision was to bring this BIA budget over 200000 And back then, ten years ago, we go back to 2013, where I attended the OBIA conferences, the same thing. Our budget was low and really went towards salary. So you couldn't do much. They would, they would do wine festival and that was about it. And so what your dilemma is as a board, you guys have a vision, you're here. And what you're showing us here as a council is this is your vision, but you need help to get there. And, and this budget tonight will create that vision. So can you imagine 10 years ago, if the board, the BIA board had done the budget decision that, that you guys are presenting this evening, we'd be 10 years ahead. And so you add those dollars. And if you look at beautification, the amount, I, I, can, I need my glasses here, but that kind of money will go fast. 
But if you save it year after year, after three, four, five years, you're going to see things. And with what the things that we're trying to do here at the CIP and the Main Street, uh, I, I think it's going to come hand in hand. But we have to start. And we finally have a board here with the leadership and vision that that's willing to to make this uh, happen. So uh, kudos to you guys for that. Thank you. Okay, well, you can see a little bit of what the town is doing with the Les Bronx, what we've, uh, you know, we've accomplished there. I mean, there's still a ways to go. The trees have to come up, the lighting and a whole host of other things. And maybe that's a good starting point in terms of uh, the BIA, you know, in, in that area. Um, I mean, uh, you're here and I find it ironic that you're asking us to pass the budget and it's really your budget and and not ours in that certainly in that regards but I, I certainly support that but I have a question that's not budget related but it also has an opportunity because I was I was intrigued and, and very happy to see in your beautification piece when you um, made mention of uh, communities like Niagara and the lake and so forth and what they're doing in in their um, in their area of the beautification, but one of the pieces, uh, creating an atmosphere for pedestrian traffic, creating an atmosphere for active transportation. And you can't do that when you got a racetrack going through the center of town. And so my, my question is, is obviously what we're, we, we've tried to establish and for some, I mean, not all, but you know, we've been criticized, you know, in terms of, you know, the so-called traffic issues and, and, and so forth in the area. But the intention is, to do walkability and active transportation in, in the area. So as business people that are in the heart of that area, like, I, I, I'd like your opinion, uh, because if you've seen the concept uh, that's been, uh, we've had, I don't know how many charrettes we had, maybe a dozen or so, and it was, it was the general public that had uh, really requested that. And because we do want to slow traffic down, it's a safety concern uh, so that people can uh, patronize the businesses and the community that are starting to come. Uh, we've got 400 units of residential units that are now being uh, uh, either fully constructed or in construction now and more to come. And with that, it brings more business uh, uh, community in the area. So my question to you is, the vision of the town in terms of what we're trying to do, is it the right path as a business community? So um, I'll speak to that. Both my husband and I own uh, Oven 360 Tecumseh. So we are right on the street that I believe you're referring to. Um, and I can tell you that we had heard about the vision of the town. Uh, we were looking to come out to the Tecumseh area. We looked all over, Manning, everywhere. And then when we found out about what the town's plan was um, to expand the streets, to reduce the traffic, and to increase that walkability, and I think I even heard somebody mention something similar to old Walkerville, we were like, okay, we need to get on this. We need to, we need to invest here because of where we see it going in the future. Of course, I would like to see it happening a lot quicker than it is, <laughs> but um, that's, I know, I know. That's also why I'm on the BIA, right? Um, and I, I, I want to see it benefit all of the businesses. So um, me as a business, we fully support what you've done with the street. Um, you know, we have patios out there and um, we lived through it when it was the double lane versus what it is now. And it makes a huge difference in noise, traffic, everything. You can actually enjoy sitting out there now. Um, so if we could clean it up, and add, you know, the flowers and the trees and just really create that, that walkability and that atmosphere. Um, I think those are baby steps to get to the, the bigger place that the town is looking to get to. So we're trying to do something that's achievable right now um, that'll make our businesses in that area happy right now. Um, and then hopefully bring more people out to the area. And to, to piggyback on that, you know, we kind of anchored both ends of that CIP where, where I'm at and where Laura's at. And the, uh, um, like she says, we can't get there fast enough. Um, I've been, Laura's new to the area. I've been there, you know, 
since the 70s uh, with my family. And, and uh, um, we've been through a few different phases with the town. And, and uh, I, I know that we, you know, I have a trailer up in Bayfield that I go to all the time. And that town is just amazing with how they have this strip of land that's the, you know their main street and it's it's got hundreds of people per hour walking up and down that street and and there's no reason why Tecumseh shouldn't be the same but it's it's a much different um like you, like you say it can't be a drag race going through do i believe that we're on the right path yes do i do i think that uh um what will support it is the congestion the the pedestrian congestion the walkability the um and and having ways of moving people through there so the, these are all things that um are the technological wave of the future um embrace it and be the leader in it don't let's not wait and watch it what everybody else does let's be the leader in in moving forward that way and uh, i can tell you that synergy will is what the the business people want they want to be able to have uh, a town and a bia that says okay we can't do it all on our own i can't make this atmosphere just in front of my workshop or in front of my shop by myself i need i need the community to do it all all together and so yeah we're on the right track thank you very much Go ahead, Councillor Jobin. Thank you, through you, Mr. Mayor. I, I too want to thank you all for coming. I definitely feel the energy. Um, I think it's great that you have been involved and engaged in the changes and, and the vision that this council has for the community. I just as you're speaking and something you said, Leo, about um, you need the people and the money. There's something that we've observed and experienced with the Corn Fest and the Optimist Club coming together. And I just recently shared their post for the Corn Festival they're looking for the people and the money as well for success and events. And I, I don't know if you've ever considered having a conversation or relationship with their events or piggybacking or working together and collaborating somehow because they too share the same vision of community unity and beautification um, and the businesses in the area. So I, I don't know if that's something you've ever visited or would consider, or even if they would, I don't know, but they're two silos, I feel like with um, the same vision and, and maybe the same heartbeat. So I don't know. But if you would consider that. So um, Eddie, who is our chair of the events committee, uh, we just recently held a meeting um, and our coordinator, Denise, is in contact with these groups. Um, so we do talk to them. We do talk about collaborating and joining together in order to do things together. But again, as Leo said, that takes money, takes investment, it takes commitment from the BIA. Um, and we fully support it. You know, we have been talking about it and it's, it's easy for us to hop onto somebody else's event and also host our own as well. So yes, we're in full support of that. Yep, go ahead. Yeah, and, and through you, we're shipping maybe to the clerk and, and I know the BIA is here tonight too for, for council approval for the budget, but we don't have, um, a, you know, a specific report or anything. So is a motion now required to um to to approve their budget just a just a general question uh through you mr mayor to councillor houston i i would think a resolution would be appropriate if that's the direction council is going in this evening okay i'm happy to move the resolution then to approve the budget thank or, you very much. Oh, yep yep move. thank you yep supported by councillor dorner any further questions or comments at this stage on the motion all in favor what was if any that's unanimous Congratulations and uh, thank you for coming to Tecumseh Road and uh, help beautify the area. So thank you to all the business community uh, for choosing Tecumseh and uh, um, I wish you uh, you know all the best as uh, the year progresses. And uh, I'm sure with uh, Public Works and others, uh, as we continue to march on and on, on, on the beautification, they'll, they'll be willing to with, with, you know sit down and work with you. Excellent. Thank you, Mr. Worship, and thank you, Council. Very much appreciated.
You're more than welcome to stay, but I'm sure you got businesses to run. Uh, okay, so now reports, community and recreation services. Committee minutes. Oh, there. committee. Did I miss that already? Oh, committee minutes. Yeah, well, BIA. That's why that one. I thought we just did the motion. But this is the minutes. On oh, the minutes. Okay. On the minutes moved by uh, Council Houston, Council Jobin support uh, on the motion. Any questions or, or comments? Hearing none, all in favor? Opposed? That's carried. Perfect. Reports Community and Recreation Services, CRS 2023 14, to come see Arena. Uh, damage assessment. Thank you. Good evening, uh, Mr. Mayor, members of council. It's my pleasure to present this report to you this evening, an update on the Tecumseh Arena flood damage and a resulting assessment. Um, as you'll recall, on uh, July 2nd, uh, there was a significant flood event um, at the arena and recreation complex that caused storm, storm sewer lines um, to back up, resulting in damages throughout the main level of the uh, facility. Remediation and replacement work um, has been assessed and is ongoing, and we remain involved with the insurer in the early stages of our claims process. On July 11th, I was able to report uh, in some detail around the cause of loss and the areas uh, that were damaged, the front lobby, public washrooms, admin offices, dressing rooms, and participant corridor, as well as the canteen. Um, we provided in this report uh, a bit of an outline here in terms of the high level actions that took place as of July 2nd. I really want to uh, take this opportunity to stop and uh, recognize Brett Palmer, the Senior Manager of Recreation, and Dan Walicki, my Manager of Facilities and Energy Management, for their speedy response uh, and quick work. Uh, and uh, as a result of that, um, we were able to, I think, mitigate uh, and certainly ameliorate uh, any further extension uh, of damage. So uh, kudos uh, to the team here for that speedy work on the second and the third. Um, we've of course uh, been in uh, good contact with our insurance uh, adjuster um, through uh, Mr. Oje and uh, in his, his work. We've been working quite closely with St Supreme Restoration Services since July 2nd and have removed all the rubber flowing from uh, flooring from the lobby area applied antimicrobial. And uh, I wanna make sure that everyone here understands that the facility is now um, meeting health and safety environmental regulations. It is a good place for people to be and has been for some time now. Um, it, it just doesn't look very nice sometimes. <laughs> um, and that really is what I wanna to talk to in terms of the current status here. Um, we've removed all of the effective surfaces in the admin offices. Uh, we've removed the affected surfaces um, in the building. And, um, you know, we expect that work to be fully completed by the middle of this month. Um, immediately following the removal of the remaining surfaces, we will be placing temporary protective services in the uh, dressing room areas and the adjacent corridor to ensure that folks who are going on and off the ice can continue to do so in a safe way. Um, we also uh, understand that uh, the lobby and the washrooms will not have those temporary protective services. Um, until the entire uh, flooring is replaced in the spring of next year. And, uh, you know, for, for those purposes, we'll be having signage and communicating with groups and organizations to please ensure that people are using skate guards and bringing skate guards if they are choosing to go from the arena out into the lobby areas uh, for the next couple of months. I want to uh, note that these are interim measures due to the temporary nature of the situation. Um, so again, um, the appearance of the arena's flooring surfaces may remain substandard here uh, for a temporary uh, period, um, but the plan is, as you know, to replace those surfaces and bring the uh, overall arena um, back up to uh, where it was uh, prior to July 2nd. I also want to um, let folks know that uh, we have been in, um, in dialogue with facility user groups uh, over the past couple of weeks. And our primary consideration after the health and safety uh, issue was to ensure that any types of effort we were doing in order to accommodate uh, the repair remediation work was uh, in acknowledgement and recognition of the needs of those user groups. And um, you know, as a result, we know that we're going to be unable to uh, do a full replacement of those flooring surfaces until such time as that large use is over. So we do not want to negatively impact any of those user groups. That's why we'll be putting down 
temporary uh, protective flooring in the uh, participant corridor and in the uh, dressing room areas. And certainly the plan here is uh, once that big use period is over uh, in May of next year, uh, we'll be able to do a complete flooring uh, replacement throughout the entire building. So that's our, our recommendation uh, that we would proceed that way. Also, this uh, this type of, of a schedule will allow us to provide, give us time actually to make sure that we're making the right decisions with regard to the type of flooring that we'll be uh, using to replace that, uh, making sure that uh, we have time to put this project to tender, make that full consideration in terms of what the award is, and ensure that we're actually um, securing the best value for the investment uh, for the longer term instead of just an interim uh, replacement measurement. Uh, lastly, uh, in consultation uh, with um, PWES, uh, they've recommended that an independent engineering consultant be engaged to undertake a modeling assessment of the existing on-site stormwater infrastructure uh, and to recommend any potential mitigation efforts that might be required to prevent a scenario like this happening in the future. So you'll see that those are uh, a part of the costs that are uh, in the recommendations. So with that, I just wanted to uh, talk about what this report is uh, saying is that the information as provided in report CRS 2023-14 be received and that the estimated cost be approved as follows, damage remediation and replacement costs, including the deductible in the amount of $891,000 and on-site on -site stormwater infrastructure modeling assessment in the amount of $30,000 and further that these estimated costs be funded through the Arena Life Cycle Reserve. And with that, I'll pause uh, for any questions. Um, Mr. Palmer and Mr. Willicke are also here with me tonight, should you have any detailed questions. Thank you. Um, Mr. Geniak, I mean, in terms of the, the, the full amount on, on the repairs, is that, uh, that's not above and beyond what uh, the insurance is? Um, through, to that's the total of- that, that is the total amount. Um, and uh, the conversations with the insurer are about this total amount. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Yeah, go ahead, uh, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mayor, through you. Uh, thank you, Beth and, and Daniel and Brett uh, for, for this report and basically outlining uh, the next steps. And, and as you know, um, town facilities are not immune to flood just like homes. Uh, and so we're going through the same process that uh, most homeowners have done. In fact, uh, the same, I don't know if it's the same exact same date, but the Leamington Library experienced a similar flood and, and uh, the CAO was going through the same process that you're going through. And again, investigating the storm sewer and making sure that that doesn't happen again, because I think it's happened twice over there where every time there's a large rainfall. So that component is important that we mm -hmm. do that. And also that uh, you know we, we implore the insurer to see if we can get replacement costs because my question is, you know, similar to what the mayor was asking, what's the best or worst case scenario? Would the insurer, if, if all goes well, would they be able to replace, do a replacement cost? And that's what, you know, if I had a house and, and I flooded, I'd expect my insurance to, to put it back as it was. Uh, but I'm sure there's a lot of tangibles involved. Uh, so again, we'll just wait to see what the report comes back. But hopefully, uh, we have that good insurance plan that, that will be protecting the, the assets that we have there at the arena. So that, that's my concern is, you know, what, how much is that insurance going to cover at the end of the day? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to the deputy, and perhaps if uh, Mr. Oje would want to uh, add some con contribution to that response as well. Uh, we are in uh, conversations and have been working very closely with the claims adjuster and the insurance uh, company since July 2nd. Um, I think those conversations have been very positive. Uh, we're working together very collaboratively. Uh, they have been on site with uh, Mr. Willicke and the team um, many, many times over the past number of weeks. Um, and uh, I feel that, uh, you know, we're we are working together to come to a good resolution. Mr. Oje? Uh, through, through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, just further to what, what uh, Ms. Geniak said, um, it, it is still a little early, uh, the investigation's ongoing, um, but I, I certainly echo the sentiments that uh, so far it's been very positive. Um, the insurance company has hired an appraisal reconstruction consultant. Uh, so that person, uh, um, MBC company is the name, and they've, they're they doing ongoing um, work on this. And I would anticipate at some point there'll be a report that'll be shared with the town and obviously the um, uh, intact. 
um, and and we'll have a better ideal at that point. But it, but I certainly take your point that you know we want we want to know what that is, but it's it's still a little too early at this time. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Worship. Um, uh, through you to Ms. Geniak, uh, you know, thank you. And I had a similar question that the, the Deputy Mayor had. Um, I'm sure you've already uh, thought of it, but um, maybe some signage um, for mm -hmm. the, the groups, you know, due, due to flooding or something. Because um, uh, I know I frequent that uh, arena a lot with my daughter. And, uh, and I was trying to think in my mind how much we actually use, you know, the front area on skates or someone needs to go to the bathroom, right? They, they run up there and do it. So I know it's well used, but maybe just some signing, right? Due to, due to X or, you know, this, you know, it will be replaced, you know, next year. So. Yeah. Through, through Mr. Mayor to the counselor. Uh, yeah. We actually have a communications plan that we're working on. Um, Mr. Palmer, as I say, has been speaking with user groups and uh, we'd be seeking to send out direct correspondence uh, to those user groups and their users, their participants, in addition to your point around having signage in the facility, um, indicating both the temporary nature of, uh, of the reality of the situation and, uh, and you know, making suggestions around skate guards, et cetera, um, so that we can ensure that everyone understands what's happening. Yes, thank you. All right, any further questions or comments? If not, um, need a recommendation as provided on the report CRS 2023-14, uh, Tecumseh Arena flood damage assessment we receive and that the estimated cost be approved as follows, the damage uh, mediation of basement costs, including deductible in the amount of 891,000. On-site stormwater infrastructure modeling assessment uh, in the amount of 30,000, further that the estimated uh, cost be funded through the arena life cycle reserve. Moved by Councilor Tonio, supported by Councilor Jobin. On the motion, all in favor? Opposed, if any, that motion carries. Thank you. All right, we'll move on to uh, the development services, uh, DS 2023-15, the adoption of the Tecumseh Housing Action Plan. And I'll turn it over to Mr. Hillman. Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and good evening uh, to everyone. Um, I will try to... Uh, uh, provide a very high level summary. You'll recall that uh, myself and Mr. Solani presented the uh, draft to come see housing action plan at our last meeting. So the purpose of this evening's meeting is to seek adoption of that document. So I'll just go on a very high level uh, through where we're at. So the federal government had announced uh, sometime in March, a $4 billion Canada wide housing accelerator fund. Their intent is to increase uh, housing units by hundred thousand across the country. Um, for the town to be involved in this funding program, we must have a housing action plan, and it must include uh, housing supply growth targets, uh, which are uh, reflect the total number of permitted housing units projected over a three-year period, uh, additional targets for housing projected um, for type, as well as affordable housing, and we must have a minimum of seven proposed initiatives that will help us achieve our committed targets for accelerated housing. Um, We've really presented already two reports to council. One was uh, earlier in April when we were seeking um, authorization to retain a consultant who ended up being Mr. Solani, who's here in the audience uh, this evening, if we have any questions or comments required from him. Um, and the second was at our last meeting where we summarized uh, through PowerPoint the actual housing action plan and the initiatives that it was intended to uh, bring forward and have council endorse and um, the type of funding that we were seeking through that through that document. Um, that was then circulated to council after the meeting. And of course it's attached to this report um, for consideration for adoption. So really what I wanted to highlight tonight was the housing action plan that's in front of council does um, consider our housing targets uh, that would occur with um, housing accelerator funding and what would uh, be possible without and without that funding. Um, the analysis that we've conducted through this process and the report goes into some detail concludes that an additional 267 housing units, which is a very specific number, we realize, um, but that is required by this funding process. They want to see um, the a number of housing units you think you can accelerate and the type of housing units you can accelerate. So we went through an exercise to develop that number. And over a three-year period, we uh, project that an additional 267 housing units would be permitted over the three-year period, which would give us a grand total of projected numbers of five, just over 500 units over those three years. Um, 
The housing action plan also must provide a commitment to undertake a housing needs assessment for Tecumseh, which is quite timely, given there is one being undertaken by the Windsor, uh, as part of the Windsor Regional Housing Affordability Strategy that the county is actually um, initiating and going through an RFP process. So that will work well for the town. Um, establishment of housing plan, um, housing action plan goals, of which there are five. And um, we must have a minimum of seven initiatives that council endorses as part of the plan. Um, and these initiatives are intended to uh, be the means by which we will accelerate housing in the municipality. In fact, the housing action plan for Tecumseh proposes 10 initiatives. We did review those in, in significant detail uh, at our last meeting. So I wasn't proposing to go through those. They are documented in this covering uh, report that I'm just reviewing now. And really, ultimately, the initiatives are intended to accelerate the delivery of housing over a very short period of time, but also the intent of the federal program is that we introduce initiatives that have systemic long-term changes that will help promote our housing issues beyond the three-year period. There, there really is a, an emphasis on placing Tecumseh and those who adopt a housing action plan into a, a zone where we are fundamentally uh, putting a lens on the housing issues that are faced by our community. Um, very quickly, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, we did go into a little bit of detail around the financial implications, and this turns to the reality of why is it's, it's important to um, identify a target for accelerated housing. You'll see that uh, the way the funding program works, there's three components. There's base funding, which is $20,000 provided for each of the housing units that are anticipated to be accelerated. Uh, there's top-up funding for different types of housing, which includes uh, townhomes, uh, low-rise apartments, um, and then there's also um, apartments that are greater than four stories, and there's a range of, of top-up funding between seven and 15,000 for each of those types of units. And then there's an affordable housing bonus, which is uh, basically 19,000 per unit that you think you can provide through affordable housing. So, there's, there's a whole methodology on how you put these units into a spreadsheet that is provided by uh, the application portal. And, and it's illustrating right now that the town could receive between five and $7 million. Um, a good portion, of, a portion of that funding would first have to be used for the initiative. So you'll recall a number of the initiatives are either planning processes, um, maybe uh, incentives, a uh, waiving of building permit fees. And when we build the application, what we'll be seeking is compensation to the municipality for costs it incurs to fulfill its obligation to meet to to implement those initiatives as quickly as possible. Um, the remaining funds can be used for capital projects that support the accelerated provision of housing, and we're in a very good position in terms of having a number of projects to pick from because Council has just recently adopted, of course, a five and ten year capital works plan last May the emphasis of which was the introduction of new infrastructure to promote uh, the development of housing. So um, we will be uh, going through that, that list and uh, looking to see an applicable uh, project or projects that this funding could help uh, some more support uh, the construction of. Um, if we are successful um, with an application, uh, it is anticipated and it would be the reality that a further report would come back to a council seeking authorization to sign any funding agreements. And at that time, we would break out the nature of the initiatives and the funding that is, is being sought through the uh, successful application. Finally, a breakdown of how the approved funding would come through to the municipality. Um, and uh, we're advised that year one, the first advance would be 25% of the total approved funding. And then year two, three, and four would be another 25%. Through the process, we're actually having to report on um, uh, this, the success of the, of the program, and that will affect uh, the funding that happens. And really, one thing we wanted to acknowledge was that really the outcome of the initiatives don't exclusively lie with um, this plan. It will require uh, significant coordination with our uh, building partners. It, the bulk of housing provided in the municipality is through uh, private developments, builders, um, and also just um, homeowners who see an opportunity for uh, modifying their homes for ARUs, uh, converting a garage into a housing unit. That could be done for any number of reasons, but it will really um, rely on the success of converting the initiatives, which are attempting to create accelerator um, ideas and that those convert into people making decisions to build housing. 
So as much as we uh, view this as a very important document, we also view it as a very important uh, step to be engaged with our, our uh, housing provider partners. So Mr. Mayor, the recommendations uh, are summarized that uh, this report be received, that the housing action plan that's attached to the report be approved, uh, that administration be authorized to submit a housing accelerator fund applica application to Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation, and further that uh, the Chief Financial Officer and the Director of Development Services be authorized to sign documents required to support the application, such as a preliminary uh, attestation document and an integrity declaration. Again, happy to answer any questions. Mr. Solani is here as well. And I'd like to thank Larry for the work he's done to put this together. And also um, it was the Development Services Division, but also uh, Public Works was very engaged, the CAO's office, um, friends and parks and uh, finance, of course. So thank you to everybody for the work. And there is still more work to be done, but it got us this far. Thank you. Well, thank thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Hillman. Yeah, I'm glad. Uh, I, it, I mean, it it seems to be a Reader's Digest version in terms of what uh, you know, and we were able to look at the report in depth. And and uh, this is a significant report in a short period of time. So, I, I certainly, on behalf of all of us around the horseshoe, want to certainly can commend uh, yourself and your department and and uh, Mr. Solani and. Even though uh, he was on vacation, he was still working on our behalf from British Columbia. So, uh, certainly, our thanks to all of you and and I and uh, um, to be able to meet the deadlines. And it's, uh, I mean, the government, you know, they they come out with their wisdom with a lot of these programs and that, and they just say, oh, by the way, uh, you've got about two weeks or three weeks, you know, to put in your application. So, uh, on top of everything else that uh, every department uh, has to. Uh, uh, to do on behalf of uh, you know our citizens and the community to to kind of set time aside to just uh, get this uh, application ready and I if I'm not mistaken I think I, in, I county uh, municipalities I think we're the only one that actually submitted and in, in, uh, I believe City of Windsor and so kudos to uh, to all of you and I really don't have uh, any real question but the comment is a, a thank you for the hard work that that's there and uh, fully recommend council to move forward with the application go ahead council uh, Jobin thank you through you Mr. Mayor thank you Brian um, so I just uh as the mayor did indicate, it's a significant report in a short amount of time. And um, I have had some residents review it. And so I'm more familiar with the language and processes and timelines. So, but I just, for the purpose of viewers, um, I just need to minimize this just a little bit, okay? Because they're they're conflicting old information policies or and new information, okay? So this is 267 in three years in serviceable areas. We're not just all of a sudden going to start being like, oh, somebody wants to, we're going to, no, we're, there is a plan, it's organized, and it's not excluding other future plans, for example, the Old Castle and Maidstone Hamlet. It's not saying, oh, you're dumped, because this that's still moving forward based upon timelines and infrastructure and, and that type of stuff. And this is this is like infill, and it'll be diverse. It's not just like the town saying, we, we're going to take this money, and we're going to do this. It's, it's nothing like that. It's what's available to developers and what's accessible and 267 in three years, not excluding the other plans for future planning down the road. Correct. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, the short answer is correct. Um, the longer answer is that it's 267 on top of 200 and some 30 other that we already anticipated. These are units that we are very strategically, ex we anticipate would be accelerated by virtue of the initiatives being undertaken. Um, it's not looking at shutting certain areas down at all. It's really looking at, are there things that we can do as a municipality to accelerate housing that we already anticipated? So um, our growth areas are defined, our policies are set in our official plan. Uh, this is These are just initiatives to help advance housing more quickly. Go ahead. Thank you, Worship. Thank you, uh, Mr. Hillman. And, and you did allude in your report regarding a lot of extraneous factors, such as housing market conditions, interest rates, immigration levels, and state regional economy. So even though we get this funding, it, it all is dependent on these factors, too, on how the private development you know, will, will take action. Um, 
back in June at the FCM conference, uh, the prime minister was there and he said that their, this housing accelerator fund program is gonna come this fall and that they're gonna be looking for bold, innovative plans. And I wanna thank administration because I think you guys have done that through, you know, Mr. Solani with your support to, to be able to put a good, you know, application forward. So, you know, keeping our fingers crossed, this will help, like I say, one small piece of the puzzle, but all these things have to come into play. But uh, the work that you guys have put in uh, is, is, you know, worthy to, to acknowledge and thank. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to get some funding out of this. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, if I could just very briefly, and I'll speak on behalf of Larry, who's not really here as a formal delegate, but these are ideas too that came from our developers, uh, builders, housing authorities, um, CMHC, um, you know, a breadth of people who are involved in this issue. So as, you know, as sharp as Larry and I like to think we are and our, our administrative team, this is really about talking to people over the last number of years, even about what are some of the obstacles. And I think what we have put forward is bold, but accomplishable as well. I don't want to take back then one of all the all the accolades. No, no, just kidding. No, it, you're you're being modest, Mr. Hillman. I, I know it takes a, a whole group to to come together, but um, I think it's a it's a great initiative, and at the end, our community is going to benefit from this. Move, support. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, for your sake, and Councilor Jobin, support. Councilor Tonio moved. All in favor? Opposed, if any, unanimous. All right, financial services uh, receivable. Just one more, oh, one more, sorry, I went ahead. Uh, Billy permits. Should be. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, six month building services report. So. Um, interesting that this follows the report we were just speaking to. Uh, you'll see that construction values for the six month period uh, are up. Uh, they're at 20 million, up 10 million from our prior year. Um, and you'll recall our prior year was a year where we were, there was a lot of construction going on, but it was permits from the year before that for apartments. So it's, we're in this funny little wave right now. Um, and as you'll see when we go through this, um, there's a situation that the country's facing, quite frankly, as it relates to uh, permit activity. So a lot of our value came from non-residential buildings and, and industrial building expansions. Um, number of permits is down uh, by 33% over the first uh, uh, six months of this year over last year. Um, permit types, you'll see very low on residential dwelling units, tremendously low from what had been projected. Keeping in mind our projections were being made very late last summer. Um, and the reality of our situation that the country's in right now, even globally, was not fully realized and, and I think fully acknowledged. Um, and even talking to our builders right now, there are issues going on in the marketplace, not just here, um, throughout Ontario, certainly in Canada, around um, um, interest rates, um, uh, aversion to risk, and uh, the cost of uh, supplies alone or availability of supply. So there is a disruptive moment that's taking place right now. Um, but we are seeing some hope uh, down, down the road, even this year. Uh, permit types, though, are, are quite low for residential. You'll see a number of additions that were uh, put on this year. Um, another element that we've really focused on as a division is uh, the closing of open permits. Um, with our new team that is, that is overseeing this division, it was realized that we have a number of open permits, and they really do bring a liability to the municipality. So there has been an emphasis on uh, closing out open permits, and it's, a, it's an appropriate time to do that right now. Um, and so you'll see that we've, uh, in 2023, closed um, a number, um, 430 to date. Um, so that's uh, quite an aggressive uh, effort being taken there. And on the financial implication side, this has been a, a difficult challenge for us. And I'll remind council that the intent for the billing services division is to have the permits fund the department, recognizing that um, in the bad years, a reserve is, is developed through the permit fees to help fund those years. We're, we're looking over right now our historical status of our reserve, but we know that we're, you know, we're facing a challenge this year. What we're forecasting in the future will ultimately pay back um, these uh, these difficult times. Um, so when I review these numbers, just being mindful of that, 
Um, we've reported only 124,000 of the 934 that had been projected for permitting this year. Um, and, and as we've talked about, it's the marking conditions, high interest rates have really affected development across the province. Um, with that lower than expected start, we are seeing that through the second half of the six month period, we know that the uptake will take place for residential, particularly with the uh, Old Castle Heights residential subdivision, which is uh, uh, being serviced as we speak. And uh, we know there's a pent up demand for permits there once that comes online in a month or so. And also with the Castle Gate Towers Business Park, which is just going into pre-construction for that subdivision, uh, some non-residential permit uptake we are anticipating. So, Mr. Mayor, the uh, recommendation is to receive the report, but I would also be happy to answer any questions. Any questions or, or, or comments? Uh, then uh, motion received. Councilor Tonio, Councilor Houston, all in favor? Opposed, if any, that's carried. Thank you. And then we'll move on to um, the okay, financial services, our tax uh, receivables, uh, June 23. Mr. Kitzos. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and members of council. Uh, so this report is our mid-year report on the status of taxes receivable for the town. So we ask that council receive this report for information. Uh, in summary, at the midway point of the year, uh, we do see that uh, some of our taxes receivable are increasing a bit over the since uh, reaching a low for us of 4% at year end for 2021. So uh, mid-year receivables figures tend to be uh, higher percentages, usually 24 to 28% range. And you'll see in the, uh, in the chart that we have uh, that in 2023, we are slightly increasing, but we're uh, along where we've been the last five years. We're in a typical range. The, uh, the, the other measure that we include is the arrears as percentage of tax receivable, and that speaks to the age of the receivables. So uh, a, an increasing uh, measure there would be concerning uh, as that speaks to the age of receivables, but you see that that is relatively quite stable at the 10% at the midpoint of the year. Uh, with respect to receivables in gross dollars and arrears uh, in the number of properties, both of those have increased uh, over 2022 at the mid-year point. So there are a couple of factors that could contribute to that. One is uh, what we believe the primary factor is uh, our tax registration process did start a little later this year than normal. So normally we would do our final notices around April. Our final notices uh, went out uh, in June and we did allow property owners till the end of April, uh, sorry, till the end of August uh, to come up with a payment plan or make payment. So generally that tax registration process does uh, bring in a lot of payments. Uh, so usually that would happen before uh, the mid year. So we do uh, believe that that is part of the reason uh, for the higher value this year. It is something we we obviously will monitor. Uh, the more important figure we that we rely on is the year-end figure. So I can say that uh, in the last five years, uh, our year-end taxes receivable have been in the four to 4.7% range. Uh, anything below 5% is considered low risk uh, by the province. 5 to 10% is considered uh, moderate risk. So we're still in the low risk category. Uh, but it's something that uh, obviously with the, uh, uh, the higher tick in these figures, the last two years, it's something that we will monitor closely for this year and to see if in fact uh, it was due to the tax registration process starting a little later. Any questions or, or certainly comments at this stage? Then a motion to receive the report. Deputy Mayor Ricchetti, Councillor Houston, all in favor? Opposed, if any, that's carried. Thank you. Okay, our next uh, uh, reports from uh, our Legislative and Clerk Services uh, 2023 uh, Council Conference uh, for the year of 2024. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, for this report, uh, administrator wanted to streamline or was hoping to be able to streamline the process for council members uh, looking to attend uh, conferences, workshops, and seminars uh, next year. 
Um, so as a result, uh, firstly, it's recommended that consideration be given ahead of time to authorizing uh, attendance at the 2024 conferences that are listed under the first recommendation in, in the table. Um, and if if you look at the table, um, certainly a lot of a lot of the typical conferences that municipal representatives attend, uh, whether that's AMO, FCM, uh, Ontario Good Roads, or Roma, among others. Um, and then secondly, some of these same associations provide additional opportunities for training on emerging trends in, in uh, the municipal sector, and those opportunities certainly arise throughout the year every year. Um, so these additional training opportunities require council approval. Um, past practice to date has been to bring um, a, a conference of interest or a seminar whatever or webinar, whatever the matter may be, uh, to add that as a communication item onto the council agenda and to uh, receive one-off approval at an upcoming council meeting. Um, and certainly that's fine, but it could potentially lead to delays. And it, and it could, you know, in some sessions could potentially fill up quickly. Um, so as a result, uh, the second part of the recommendation, uh, administration's recommended that authority be granted ahead of time for members of council to attend these training opportunities as they arise. Um, and certainly those opportunities would still be in accordance with the town's professional development policy, specifically section four, and, and obviously as budget allows. Um, so the recommendations are noted and uh, if the council has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. All right, thank you very much. Go ahead, uh, Councillor uh, Houston. Uh, thank you, Worship. To uh, Mr. Roger, I, I, if I can recall, in my previous nine years, we've always approved, or these are pretty much the standard, the, the go-to um, conferences, always approved, never been an issue. So my only question is, would it be appropriate to include this rather than having this report come back every year that we include it in you know any uh, uh policy or or something just to make it a little more efficient and that we wouldn't require this to come back every year hmm. because to, to me it just seems like something we, we do we approve you write the report we say yes maybe we you know we, we go or we're not so i'm just wondering efficient see wise can we include this in a policy that says you know, council would go to this and I think it's to be open and transparent. I, I'm just questioning if there's a, a I, I, I hear your point. And so, uh, but I, I would think on a year, at least once a year would be uh, maybe proper only for uh, to be open and transparent, you know, to, to the general public. That, that would be my only thing, but, and but I, I hear you. I, I'm okay I, with that, but I'm just, you know, yeah. So, and, and through you, Mr. Mayor, um, that would be a reason, I, I, I guess. I mean, the policy itself, you know, still provides the proviso that it's within the yeah, departmental yeah. budget. Um, so that, but I, you know, it, it is, I guess, in theory, it is a possibility to, you know, streamline that. But but you're right. Uh, it wouldn't be coming to council. It wouldn't be, there wouldn't be that, uh, that, that uh, transparency. Because I know Mr. Kitzo and his department would keep us on the uh, on the straight and narrow. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. We're in a move report. I'm prepared to move. Yep. Thank you. And then support uh, Councilor Dorner on the motion. All in favor? Oppose if any of that's carried. Uh, okay. Next is all still on. Uh, it's the. Um, Legislative uh, account, Clerk's uh, Services uh, 2326, Right of Access for Maintenance. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the Building Department recently contacted, contacted the Clerk's Department inquiring whether the town already had a bylaw uh, to permit a resident to access the property of their adjoining neighbor when required um, so as to be able to attend to you know, uh, repair or maintenance to their own property. and and building department came to us as a result of an inquiry from a resident. And I apologize, I may, I may be mistaken as far as the exact scenario, but I believe it related to 
needing access to the property uh, on the neighbor's property so as to fix a fence. Um, I, I could be mistaken on that. It might have been a, another scenario. Um, but to answer the inquiry from building department, the town does not currently have such a bylaw. Um, and administration does recommend that council give consider consideration of such a bylaw. Uh, several municipalities do, in fact, have such a bylaw, and um, it's permis it's it's permitted under the municipal act. Uh, if I can just read from section one thirty two of the municipal act, um, section one thirty two provides that a municipality may pass a bylaw to authorize an owner or occupant of land to enter adjoining lands for the purpose of maintenance making repairs or alterations to any adjoint to any building fence and or other structure on the land of the owner or occupant but only to the extent necessary to carry out such maintenance repairs or alterations um, and, and so accordingly by law 2023 086 is before a council for its consideration and it establishes the rules for obtaining access uh, to a neighboring property uh, so just to briefly go through that, uh, just some of the highlights. Um, the resident, again, can only access uh, if prior consent has been obtained or if the requesting owner otherwise complies with the provisions of this bylaw. And only if the repairs cannot be made from the owner's own lands or from a street adjoining the owner's lands. Uh, the resident has to provide notice to both the town and the adjoining neighbor uh, at least five days prior notice. Uh, which will include details of the work and the expected timeframes. Uh, the notice will include an acknowledgement signed by the resident uh, who's seeking access, uh, stating that the neighbor's lands will be left in the same condition. Entry will be limited to the days and time periods noted. Resident will save the neighbor harmless from claims for injury. And there will be confirmation of insurance attached to the notice, uh, naming the adjoining landowner as an additional insured during that time period. Um, and then finally, the town, and, and the, the, this was uh, taken from a typical bylaw from, uh, from uh, uh, or we considered and reviewed um, other bylaws throughout the province. And these were some typical provisions that were uh, included as that bylaw. And, and lastly, the town would have uh, discretion under the bylaw uh, to make inspections or make orders as appropriate for any contraventions. And what that means essentially is that uh, the town would have the opportunity um, when, when a request or a notice, is, a notice has been provided um, to determine whether that request is in fact reasonable and if it's, uh, if it's in fact necessary, depending on the notice that's been provided. Um, so, uh, so, uh, yeah, yeah, bylaw 80, uh, sorry, bylaw 2023, uh, it should be 86, entitled right of access, looking for, sorry, looking for the report 2023-26 to be received, and that bylaw 2386 and be considered by council for first, second, and third reading. Council's pleasure. Move, move recommendation, support, Council Jobin. Any further questions or comments? Hearing none, all in favor? Opposed, if any, that's carried. Thank you. Move on to uh, Public Works Engineering Services, uh, Town Line and Mooney uh, Creek Drain, Emergency Replacement of Residential Access Bridge. And that's at 5285 County Road 19, Tender Award. Mr. Bartnick? Thank you, Your Worship, and good evening, uh, Mayor, members of Council. Uh, as, you were, as you may recall, on July 25th, earlier this year, administration presented a report to Council for the emergency replacement of the residential access bridge for 5285 County Road 19 uh, over the West Town Line and Mooney Creek Drain. Uh, the emergency designation through OMAFRA uh, allows for the installation of the residential access bridge to be completed before adopting uh, a drainage report under Section 78 of the Drainage Act. Uh, a tender call was advertised on the town's website, along with being posted and tenders account on July 20th. Uh, two tender submissions were received on August 3rd. Uh, the engineer's construction estimate for this project was 850,000, 
Uh, the lowest tender is just under 750,000 and is below the engineer's esti estimate by $100,000. The recommendations uh, contained within the report, uh, it is recommended that the tender for the West Town Line and Mooney Creek Drain, the emergency replacement of residential access bridge for 5285 County Road 19 in the amount of $749,970, excluding HST, be awarded to Sterling Ridge Infrastructure Incorporated, and that bylaw 2023-87 be given first, second, third, and final reading to authorize the mayor and clerk to execute an agreement satisfactory in form uh, to the town solicitor with Sterling Ridge Infrastructure Incorporated. Be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Barton. Any questions? Uh, I think, go ahead, uh, Councilor Jobin. I do through you, Mr. Mayor, thank you. Uh, Phil, I'm sorry, I just have to ask, like, are these like pre-stressed concrete slabs for the bridge? Um, through your worship, uh, I don't have those details uh, handy. I do recall from the drainage report that these, it, it's not your typical residential culverts or drainage culverts. Um, I believe the span um, from bridge abutment to bridge abutment was eight meters in span. So it, it is quite a large structure itself. Um, yeah, I feel like the existing ones, and I know they're, you know, 67 years old, it's massive there. I, I don't recall seeing like galvanized culverts there. I just thought they were like slabs of concrete. But anyways, this just, you know, sticker shock. So I'm just curious of, I don't know, anyway, but okay, thanks. That information is something that we could follow up on and, and email to council uh, for information. All right, any further questions or comments? Move the recommendation. On the, or accept the tender, moved by uh, uh, Councilor Tonio, supported by Councilor Houston. On the motion, all in favor? Voice if any, that is carried. Thank you. All right, Mr. Clerk, we, uh, we're now into bylaws. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Bylaws for Council's consideration for first and second reading tonight. Bylaw 2023-086, right of access for maintenance, and bylaw 2023-87, West Town Line and Mooney Creek Train, Emergency Replacement of Residential Access Bridge, 5285 County Road 19. And also, if it's Council's pleasure this evening, that those same two bylaws also receive consideration for third reading. Two readings, Councilor Donner, Councilor Tonio. Any questions or comments on those bylaws? All in favor? Oppose, if any, that's carried. Third reading is now in order. Deputy Mayor McKetty, Councilor Houston, all in favor? Pose if any, that is carried. Unfinished business, members of council. New business. I have some new business, but I, I'm going to direct it to administration. But um, I'm beginning, uh, you know, and I think members of council have received phone calls as well in terms of uh some of our real estate personnel and developers on uh, the um the Manuel corridor in particular the hamlet and uh talking about telling the the information that uh, or, or sharing the information uh to the residents on the intersection and and uh and on on Manuel that um the lands that are dedicated as uh development on which is the the hamlet which uh we've worked for the past 10 years and and uh for residential development has said that that's going to be a parking lot for lg and um obviously said well that's that's not going to happen that's not going to be a parking lot and uh, it's unfortunate that um real estate people that are supposed to be um you know know the area should have at the very least called Mr. Hillman, who's our planner, to let him know exactly what we have planned there. We're building homes and some commercial entities and so forth. So my ask to administration is on uh, through commu our communications through um, uh, to really uh, go out to, onto our, our social media 
and basically relay the fact that there are some false information that's been um, passed to the residents of that area uh, in terms of uh, uh, this so-called parking lot that's going to be built there. Uh, it makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. And, uh, and maybe uh, as well as put, uh, um, you know, our, our Tecumseh Hamlet, uh, you know, what we do have um, on our, our um, website. And just to, I mean, if, if, if it's, if it's, you know, real estate people or developers are basically saying falsehoods in that area, I can understand why citizens would be nervous. And if we were to, if we were to put par a parking lot there, then every one of us don't deserve our job sitting here. And so it's, it's, it's scheduled for development for homes, nothing but homes. And the only parking lot there is going to be the driveways to those homes. That's it. And, and I don't know if, if the residents here are here to hear that, but that's the reality. Uh, whoever's telling you the tales, it exactly that, it's a tale. And I, I feel sorry for the residents, in particular from one that I had heard, uh, selling their, uh, I think it's, it, it's a home, a uh, family home, people, and, and, and the parents are in long-term care, and they say, you know, hurry up and sell. I'm saying, well, don't hurry up and sell. Uh, it, it's basically... Um, I'm, I'm going to leave it at that. But the bottom line is, is that false information about property is, is that the town has an official plan dedicated for residential development. That's exactly what it is. And I think let's keep it very basic on, on uh, communi communicating that just to the residents in that area who have been calling us. Uh, just in response to that, Mr. Mayor, I think we can certainly use social media to point to the Tecumseh Hamlet secondary plan information, which is already on the website, yep. um, but we can certainly amplify that and make it easy for people to find what the plan is for the residential and mixed use developments in that area. But that is part of the town of Tecumseh. You're quite correct. It's not part of the city of Windsor, so it is not there to service the LG plant. Through your worship, and also maybe a letter to the Windsor Real Estate Board or a phone call where they can send out a little memo to all the realtors um, yeah. that we've heard or, you know, that that there's some uh, individuals that are purporting this uh, to the community and, and, and just to lay the facts and that hopefully they'll be able to share that with the, the other real estate. Yeah. Uh, th thank you, uh, Your Worship. And, and just uh, further to that, I believe there is a second or an upcoming PIC for the Hamlet area. Um, so when we know exactly when that is, I think it's tentatively set. But if we can put it out there in advance, just to let everyone know, here's when the revised plan is coming back out, we can do that. Yeah, invite the uh, real estate board to come and, and take part. And we would normally do that through social media. So that's our standard practice. Uh, you know, a letter to the real estate board is not normally uh, our standard practice, but if count, if that's council's wish and the deputy mayor wants to make that a motion, we can act on it. I, I believe just a phone call, just a conversation with their administrator, their CAO at the real estate board. I'm not sure the name uh, and see what they suggest. Um, I just have one new business. Um, this is for Ms. Geniak. I'm not sure it's probably predates you, but the storyboard that we have at Lakewood uh, Park, um, 1812, I think we installed it in 2012. It's fading and it's 10 years old. I don't know the life expectancy of these storyboards, but I would think when we do a storyboard, it should last longer. Uh, so I don't know if you can look into it as, you know, maybe come back to council. If we do any future storyboards, maybe change the supplier or the material so that they last longer. But the, the one of the, the retreat along the river, I believe it was, uh, we had done that to commemorate the War of 1812. Um, it's fading. And so I don't know if it, it was brought to my attention, you know, as a town looking at any maintenance. But with storyboards, I don't know, because there's a cost a one time. But do we... You know, get another one done. If we do, do we, you know, but I, I expect them to last more than 10 years if we do that. It's through, it's through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yes, we're, we're looking at a number of those different kinds of signs. Um, many of the signs on storyboards, as you would call them, are 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 faded. Um, the weather's 
very harsh, particularly in that location. Um, currently, we don't have any uh, budget set aside for any replacement uh, for those, but uh, we are looking at uh, costing what some of those replacements might look like as part of the upcoming capital budget uh, submission. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Worship. Just uh, one, one uh, item to note new business. I believe we've got a, uh, an, a, an additional opening on the BIA. I believe another uh, one more director has resigned. Um, so that would be two open two open spots. So I don't know. I just wanted to make you aware um, if, you know, early fall or in September, we may post for uh, some applications for that. Uh, I believe the board now sits at six. So... Just to just to pass that along. Can I add uh, to when uh, both of you are at the meeting or at the meeting, uh, uh, councillor, that direct their board too to go out and, and, and even bring some recommendations, for, you know, to the board here. We'll do. Any further new business? Hearing none, then. Uh, I need a confirmatory bylaw for the proceedings this evening. Councillor Jobin, Councillor Tonio, all in favor? Opposed? That's carried. Any notices of motion? Go ahead. Councillor Tonio, I think we had talked something about you were going to bring up the Tecumseh Road, but under notice of motion, I don't know if it's appropriate or based on the new procedure bylaw, which takes an effect, I think you said September, right? So it's been a year now and we just talked tonight that we asked the BIA that question, you know, do they support it? They do support it. But if if we could get a report from Public Works on any recommendations to improve Tecumseh Road, uh, if you find that there's a couple spots that might not need to be there and come back or left turn lane, but still to keep the same uh, concept that we've established there, you know, with, with the elimination with on-street parking. Uh, sometimes there's a you know a couple spots, for example, that I'm thinking of in front of Pat and Hanks. Could those be eliminated? Would that help? Yes or no? Uh, just to kind of give us a yearly look. It's been a year now since we've established that. Uh, uh, if we can get a report for that. Go ahead. Uh, so, uh, Deputy Mayor, you're asking, you're giving notice of a motion that you're planning to bring in September to that effect. Is that what we're? Sure. So we'll expect a motion from you for the September meeting on that. Yes. Okay. Very simple. Just to you know, he the report can say everything's working as is, stay the course, or you know, if we need to eliminate a few spots or add a left turning lane, I, I want that opportunity for administration to give us that feedback. Right. And I'm just sorry. I'm just clarifying uh, the process here is that you will actually bring the notice in September, and then if council supports the motion, then the report will be worked into the. Right. Correct. Plan. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Anything else? We'll ring okay here. Okay. Next meeting, Tuesday, September 12th, a 5 p.m. public council meeting on the Cunningham drain, 5 30, uh, the Shuttleworth drain, and 7 p.m., our regular council meeting. So if no further questions or comments, adjournment is now in order. El Antonio, Council Houston, all in favor? Always if any, that is carried. This meeting is now adjourned.